Good morning, everybody. Uh, firing up another study stream today. So today actually uh, marks a first. We're doing two study streams on one day because this weekend I have some uh, uh, sudden out of or yeah, out of townage issues. You know, I got to go out of town for some family stuff um, over the weekend. So I'm doing some extra streaming earlier in the week to make up for it. So in the 28 days, we'll still have 28 streams going out, but not exactly one per day. You know, it's plan B, it's a backup plan. Whenever you make a challenge for yourself, uh, which is what this is, 28 days of streaming. I've never streamed before. I think I did three streams before I started this. Um, hitting 28 days in a row, you know, never doing it before can be pretty tough. And then suddenly when you have some family issues to take care of, um, you know, I made a commitment to do this, so I've got to do it. I've got to find a workaround uh, because I'll be out of town, no access to the computer and stuff. So, uh, you know, this is my workaround. This is plan B, doing a couple days before uh, my weekend and then one day after on uh, Monday next week. I'll, hitting, I'll be hitting two, uh, two study streams again. So today we'll start with some hand reading practice, which is going to be my range, uh, or I should say I'll be ranging myself. Uh, just like we did last week. Then we'll hit lessons learned from the course, skill number two. And by the course, I'm talking about Ed Miller's The Course, of course. And skill number two is uh, don't pay people off. A really good, really good skill to learn from. Um, so we'll see what we learn from that. And then we'll do some filters for facing turn and river raises with showdown. We want to see what kind of hands these players show up with um, when they're raising us on the, on the Turner River. And then there's the later uh, session, which will be about four hours after I end this one. I'll probably start it at 1030 or so, give or take 1030. Cool beans. I've alerted the world that we're streaming. So now I believe we are ready to go. All right. So let's do this. Um, you can see my year to date right now, almost 10,000 hands. Um, not going to put in that many hands this week because of going out of town, but, uh, you know, things are looking okay. Just down two buy-ins, no biggie made a, made back a buy-in last or the night before last a little over a buy-in altogether. Um, so this is just six max. I've been making some money on full ring as well. Um, I guess it's a good thing. You can't really combine the stats from two different, uh, game formats, six max and full ring, but you know. Uh, it would be nice because I'd have way more than just 97, 9,700 hands. So if we're going to do some hand reading, let's look at showdown hands here. So showdown hands, we have uh, 1,100 hands to go through. The other day, I think we... I can never remember this. Pocket Kings looking at the opponent's range. Yeah, I think that was that hand. It's one of those two. I don't think we've ever looked at this Queen's hand. Let's take a look for some decent action on our part. Check, check, or call, call, check. No. Bet, bet, bet. Raise, bet, bet. What is this hand? Flush, ace high. Cool. We get to see a raise, bet, bet hand. Good, good. So. Also got our trusty split suit. Remember, if you want to get uh, split suits templates, just go to splitsuit.com slash templates. And then um, uh, it's a, I don't know what, a donation download. I don't know what it's called exactly, but you can download it for free. You set your own price. And then um, I gave him $10 for these three forms. It's, I think it's totally worth it. Um, split suit's a good guy. He puts out a ton of free content. You've got to support him somehow. So I gave him 10 bones for that or for this. So just getting the page set up. Cool beans. Okay, so we have ace king suited. What are we going to do? Does it get folded to us? Do we get to three bet? Hmm. Folded to us. So we open right there. So we're opening on the button first off. So remember, we're ranging ourselves in this. We know we have ace king. So in the end, we're going to end up keeping that hand in our range. But let's see. Um, let's see what uh, by our actions, what our opponent might be thinking of our range. And doing this kind of stuff off the felt, ranging ourselves should help us on the felt when we're ranging our opponents. Just any time you're thinking about ranges and stuff is great. So um, this is my standard 31% um, on the button and the small blind when I'm opening. Let's take a look at these opponents. He does not fold often. Small sample, doesn't fold often. Folds a lot right here. So I might add 
Uh, we haven't seen any three bets. He's very passive in general. I might be adding a few more here. Let's add those. And let's add those puppies right there. Just because he folds so much and he's in ultimately the worst position, the small blind at the table. Um, so let's give myself a little wider of a range. And um, uh, for now, let's just put our opponent on pocket jacks. Who knows what he'll end up having in the end. Um, that doesn't matter because we're arranging ourselves in this, uh, in this hand reading uh, practice. Oh, one caller. So you can see right there, big gap in his calling. It's only 18 hands, but on average he calls 57% of the time. This foo loves to see flops. We haven't seen any buttons yet, or button calling, I guess. Um, so we'll just give him, I mean, we can give him anything. Let's give him something smaller. He might actually three bet with jacks, who knows? Don't know much about him yet. So as of right now, if he had a hand that bad, we actually have uh, our range is 40% 40, 40 because his eight speed, I mean, his eight speed every single non-paired hand that we have. So it's understandable. So on a 9, 10, 6, Diamond Club Club. All right. So what do we got now versus his 8s? Uh, we dropped a little bit of equity at 38%. But we do have the two over cards, backdoor flush draw, backdoor straight draw. And he folds 50% of the time, just one out of two. So right now, I mean, the way things look, we've got to be throwing out the C-bet here. He has so many hands in his range that doesn't hit this. He could have been calling with all his deuces through fives that are going to fold. He could be calling with a king four offsuit that's going to fold. I mean, there's so much stuff. We've, we've got to throw a bet out at it for sure. Even though he does have a wide range and it's likely he had a pair or a gut shot or a flush draw himself or something. Um, but he didn't hit it strong. Mm, he could have hit it strong. It's not likely that he hit this flop strong. So, oh, he throws out the little bet there. Mm, a tiny little, um, uh, what do you call it? A tiny little dog lead right there. Good. We throw out the raise. Now, I'm not such a fan. Two and a half X is decent, but I often prefer in these spots to make it a full three X when they min bet because it's only six big blinds. I was going to toss at least five big blinds at it. Make it one more big blind. I'm bluffing here, essentially. Uh, if he calls, great. I still have lots of different things I can hit on the turn uh, that help me, but... In this instance, I'm raising, and I think it needs to be raised a little bit more. So, before he before he makes his play, let's see here. What are we making this with? Um, are we raising? I think we're raising this much with our sets to get value out of a passive guy. So let's keep that in mind. We're playing against a passive guy. We're thinking he's going to call us down the streets, or hoping he's going to call us down the streets. We're doing this with our straights. We're doing it sets. Two pair. Over pair doing it for sure top pairs um yeah i guess 10 jack 10 queen all that all that different kinds of tens 10 eight is a gut shot sure why not why aren't we doing with it that too as well it's such a small bet i mean we're doing it with just about all of our range because uh uh because it's a small bet and we're in position want to bluff this passive guy off the hand yes he is passive he's making a bet meaning he might have hit something but um we're not going to put him on like a set right here or a flop straight with a seven eight kind of a thing no, no, no. We'll keep him at the... Oh, pocket eights end up having a gut shot on this board. Uh, let's see here. Middle pair. Weak pairs. What are those? Oh, all the different sixes. Um, I'm often going to just be calling with those right there and seeing what he does. Although it is a tiny bet. No, I like the raise versus a tiny bet. If he would have made it a full dollar or a dollar twenty-five, I could call. But against that small bet. Ace highs. Um... Like, a lot of those are really strong aces. Over cards of the board, some of them had draws and stuff. I like raising with those as well. And look at the size of my raise. It's five big blinds. I mean, that's a really small bluff. I mean, I could be doing it with just about... Uh, let's not put that in. Most of these other cards are... Uh, everything else is contained. Let's see. Gut shots, I'm doing it. Over cards, I'm doing it. Two card backdoor flush draws? Oh, lots of them are aces. Yes, I'm doing it with those as well. Okay, so all we're raised right here. Because of his tiny bet, he's not able to um, narrow our range much at all. Our play is made by most of our pre-flop range 97% of the time. Uh, hold on. Oh, yeah. There we go. So 97% of the time, we are making this play right here. Before I get too far...
Just making my notes. Four eight. Oh, not too long ago. Um, one of the one of the things about me, it seems like as I watch and I hear people talk about poker, people have really good memories and really good recollections of hands. Um, and maybe they're tied to emotional states or like big moments in their life, like World Series of Poker, a main event kind of a stuff. But I honestly do not remember squat about the hands I played. This is on the 8th, which was uh, 10 days ago. I do not recall this hand at all. Zero. I don't even remember Frankie. If you said, Sky, you played against Frankie 234 and won a big pot off of him 10 days ago, I would say what? So um, I don't remember squat about this hand. Uh, so record the da -da, SB caller. Um, Hmm. Okay, just some notes for myself to help me remember. Um, as a percentage form, whoops. I do not recall. Remove the eight, ten, nine, six. Percentage form was. 34.5 458 cool and that's often his tiny little 2BB donkleet is often a uh, uh, a very weak bluff because he is um, because there's so many different draws on this board it's a very weak semi bluff I should say he's trying to just take this pot down now with that tiny little bit uh, so 97.4% well let's see what happens I don't yeah he doesn't raise at all but let's see 120 okay so he just calls at that point so we narrowed our range down 97 point or uh, two point six percent, not much at all, to three hundred and seventy eight combos. Can't remember three seventy eight. So remember when you want to find your narrowed range, you hit Control Alt T. Okay, cool. And remember, once again, it's under commands. It's range string output. It gives you your uh, narrowed range right there uh, just for to record. So I can always come back and easily find and, and realize what I had narrowed out of the range. So let's see what happens on the turn. We get called. So before we get to the turn, um, let's think about all the cards that really add equity to our hand that allow us to, allow us to double barrel here. Um, any ace or any king... Of course, any diamond gives us the flush draw. Any queen, any jack as well, those give us um, uh, gut shots. So we have five different equity outs, five different types of cards that can hit that we're really happy with. Um, additionally, um, when a lot of players make really weak plays like this, they're often scared of, they often don't make this kind of play with a top pair hand. A top pair is often check calling because they don't want to bet and then face a big raise and then have to fold. They're often playing that a little passively. For example, if he had like, um, um, you know, jack 10 or queen 10, because it's a weaker 10 we raised, we could have an over pair. So oftentimes it's not always an equity out, but when a 10 hits, when a top pair hits on a lot of boards, when an opponent plays passively, that's a good board to barrel at, or not a good board, a good turn card to barrel at, because that top pair often scares the opponent. Um, when I have an over pair, like let's say I have pocket aces on this, and all of a sudden, like, um, if I if he checks, I bet he calls, and then another 10 comes, I'm going to be scared that he called with a 10. When somebody plays super passively like this, a tiny little bet, and then a call, I don't put them on a 10 automatically. If they check call, I can put them on a 10 that way. Um, it's just, a, I don't know, it's just maybe I'm mistaken by it, but that's often what I see. That's often how I see it. But the Queen of Diamonds Club, so that's great because it added a flush draw plus a straight draw. Um, no pair, so if he has any pair, for example, we put him on the pocket eights. Um, uh, 
uh, he definitely has us beat still at this point. If he has something, if any pocket pair, any pair has us beat currently. But uh, we have plenty of equity to draw out to something. We would love to see any jack or any uh, any diamond on the river. I'm not really an ace or a king. I'd be happy with it and check behind and see a showdown with my top pair hand. Um, but I'm pref preferring a diamond or a club, of course. So on the turn, um, we have currently 46% equity versus a random hand of pocket eights. Now he checks to us, and then we decide to make the 225. So slightly over half pot, which I'm good with. To me, when I see that sizing, it it, it means semi-bluff, that I'm on a bluff right there. Um, he's loose passive. If I'm going for his stack, I'm betting closer to two-thirds or three-quarter pot. Um, but one of the good things is this guy is super passive. He's not. He's probably not noticing my bet sizing. If he's calling on some kind of a draw or weak, uh, a weak hand with... Uh, with versus the half pot bet, he's probably making those same calls versus two thirds and three quarter pots. Um, maybe not three quarter, but at least two thirds. So if I'm going for value, I should be betting more here. This is telling me that I'm weak. So he just calls. But before we get to the ribs, let's see here. What am I betting a smaller amount with? Um, I'm not betting with my straights because there's two flush draws on the board. I've got to be betting, uh, betting bigger with my straights. My sets, I'm going for value against such a wet board. I want to charge him if he's coming along with, um, let's say he has a random random jack for an open ender. Let's say he has a uh, mm, jack eight already made a hand. Let's say he has jack seven for some weird reason. Um, my guess, the jack seven had a gut shot on the flop. He could stay in. And it was a small blind jack seven suited something could be staying in. So there's plenty of hands that he could be staying in to draw against our half pot bet. So if I had a hand as strong as a set, I'd be betting more two pairs queen nine ten nine queen seven queen se oh no queen ten um i could see two pairs making this bet i could see that yes going for small value hoping that he doesn't hit anything i could see myself doing that over pairs um on the queen king i can see myself making that smaller bet right there top pair now um, yep, top pairs, smaller bet. Some of those are draws as well. Um, pocket pair below top pair, the jacks. Yes, I've got the open ender. Plus, if he doesn't have a queen, I have the best pair. Uh, middle pair. These are all the various tens. I could see that. Yep, throwing out the double barrel with the middle pair right there. But a smaller double barrel, for sure. Weak pairs. Um, I don't think so. I think I'm often checking behind there on the weak pairs. We'll get to some draws over here in a little bit. Um, ace highs. I could be making those with some ace highs. Weak pair, because I have showdown value, I might just be checking right there. It's possible. Um, all these weak pairs are the sixes, right? Well, I guess nines are considered weak pair. So weak pairs are third pair below. Yeah. Mm. Let's add this in, but let's take out a few of these because I doubt I would be doing it with... Don't like those. I like these because I have some kind of a redraw with them. Draws, draws, king six. Not a fan of doing it with king six or a six. The nines, no. Jack nine, yes, I could do that and that with. Keeping those in. Cool, okay. Uh, da, da, da. No flush draw, no, let's not say I'm not doing open ender. Gut shots. So, well, some of those are pair plus gut shots and stuff, so I have them included. In like a pocket pair below, no, mid pair. Weak pair, king, okay, yeah. I could be doing it because I still have the equity and the queen added to a lot of those hands. I would be doing it with a lot of those. All right, so if we look at it here, we narrowed our range 75.6% uh, to 272. Okay, not bad. We started at 458 because of our actions and our bet sizing. We've narrowed our hand range down um, by 180-ish. 
hands. Not too shabby right there. Uh, oh, yeah. sure small sizing is not value so we get to the ribs and it's the 10 paired the board but the way he played I don't put him on a set or a two pair that just rivered the full house it's possible but I've definitely I definitely have to be betting at this right here 10 of diamonds uh, gives us the flush um, Oh, but against our full range, yeah. So our hand has the flush. We have a lock on this hand, pretty much, um, unless he has just some a miracle ten six or ten nine that uh, that just drew out on us. It's possible. Uh, let me see here. So we've got. I think we have a lock on this hand. What does he do? He checks. We've got a bit now. I'm hoping I bet two thirds pot, roughly two thirds. So what are we looking at? Like six twenty five or so. Oh, five, eight, five, so six bucks. I'm looking for a six dollar bet. Let's see if I do it. Oh, he's played so passively the flush hit that I want to get just a tiny bit of value from him. Um, I guess I'm making this bet because I don't think he can call with that much here. Um, did he get to the turn with a queen? Some kind of a, a top pair hand? It's possible. He could have had queen 10. Now that has a full house. Um, he could have had queen 9 possible king queen queen jack i mean there was a lot of things that had a draw on the flop containing a queen that could have stayed in and hit so there are some top pair queens that call us right here um and i think maybe with this size bet i'm going for whatever value i can out of any pair out of uh basically just any pair i'm hoping that he calls me with even a six at this point uh, but i think he'll raise us with the full house so i think this bet serves two purposes uh one to get value out of those weak hands number two is to if he wakes up with a big raise if he shoves on us we could just um assume that he has an unlikely full house river the full house on us uh yeah what jack eight of diamonds as well a straight flush on us so there's there's a few hands that beat our current nut flush right now but definitely got to be going for value. But I like the smaller bet sizing now that I think about it because there's not much he can call with on the on the uh, runner runner flush. And he calls right there. Great. So with our bet, what are we making this bet with? Um, so from his perspective, what are we betting here? Well, we're betting our quads. Okay, cool. Because we do have pocket. No, we don't. Oh, we have jack nine suited in our range. That's it. So quads or better. So we have a straight flush in our range, actually. We're betting our full houses. Um, I would say that we're betting this low as well. Our flushes, of course. Our straights, we're betting. Because um, it's a small value bet right there. I mean, we might be hoping to get called by two pair or uh, uh, just a weak pair with the pair. Or even trips. Trip tens. He has tens in his range as well. Um, over pairs. I don't think we're making this bet. I think over pairs are probably just checking on this super wet board. I mean, I could be going for some super thin value, but I'm not a big fan of that. Not on, not on this ugly board. Top pairs, I'm not betting this top pairs. Pocket pair below, I'm not going to continue. I'm not going to make a bluff at this point. Weak pairs, no. Nope. I'm just going to, I'm just going to check. But if I'm bluffing at a calling station, I shouldn't be doing that. I should not be making a bluff here. I can bluff the turn when I get some equity added, but let's say I just had a straight draw. The 10 doesn't fill my straight, um, so I shouldn't be bluffing here because the guy's a station. Definitely not. So I'm not going to say I'm betting any of those right there. You don't bluff stations in general. And if I throw out two bluffs, flop in the turn, why would I think that a river bluff would work? I don't think that it would. No, no, no. So in this instance, we narrowed our range down to... Uh, or 20.6% from the prior 53 hands. So we have such a strong range. We only have three of a kind or better. The guy should not be calling unless he can beat at least three of a kind, which makes up the majority of our range right there. 26 hands, this is half our hand. So if he has a, a straight or better, he should be calling for sure. Um, yep, yeah, I would say so.
So what does he do? He calls, of course, and then he ends up having... Are you shitting me? <laughs> I swear I did not choose this ahead of time. What a crazy coincidence. I started by thinking jacks, and I went eights. Wow, maybe subconsciously I do remember this hand. I truly don't, though. How funny is that? All right. Well, we got good value out of the pocket eights the whole time. We had his hand. Um, he dominated us on the flop and the turn. Uh, Pre-flop. Not. I shouldn't say dominate. I mean, we were 50-50 almost the whole way. Um, and then we hit our miracle out right there. One of our miracle outs. I mean, a jack would have been good, too. Uh, eight would have been good as well. No, a jack wouldn't have been good because he would have had a straight. Eight, nine, ten, jack, queen. Yeah, jack is no good. Oh, no, jack is good because we had a higher straight. Um, yeah, how, what a crazy coincidence. I choose the exact hand that he ends up having. Wow. Okay. Cool beans. How'd that happen? Out of the 1,326 hands, I guess the one that he had. It must be in there subconsciously. Holy stromboli. Anyway, so that was a pretty good hand to go through. So we narrowed ourselves based on our sizing and based on our the plays that we made, you know, the betting or the raise and then the bets. Um, we took ourselves down from 458 combos all the way down to 53. If he would have been doing this on, on the spot, he would have known that he's beat right here with just a weak pair of eights. He was hoping that we had, you know, ace king the entire way. Uh, and that, like, he probably put us on one hand. This guy has ace king. He has nothing. He could have pocket sevens, you know, whatever he's thinking he called us. We got good value on that hand. So wheat. Okay, so uh, what do we have? Ace King suited, my range. And I think that was a good hand. Definite successful hand reading hand. 10 out of 14 instances now. Okay, so let's go ahead and get to, we'll take a look at uh, the lessons learned from the course, skill number two, like I showed you earlier, the course. So um, let me see. I can I can look right here in the in the monitor. So as I hold this up to you, this is skill number two, and you can see how I make a ton of a ton of notes, highlights. I write stuff in the margins and everything. Like I really utilize my books, and I make a lot of notes within them. That's why I like hardcover books. I don't read. Um, the only ebooks that I read, even though I'm selling my book as an ebook, the only ebooks I read are like fictional books where I don't need to make notes. So in, in this stuff, you know, I'm making notes constantly throughout books. That's why all of my poker books are physical copies. Can't read ebooks or can't learn from ebooks, I should say. Uh, or I don't want to. So anyway, so lessons learned from this chapter itself. In your preflop game, from the prior chapter, he talks about you need to play tighter against raises, raise a lot yourself, and avoid offsuit hands. Totally, got to do those. Those are the key things when you're choosing good preflop ranges. The better ranges you choose preflop uh, makes your decisions easier post-flop. And that's what that's what this skill is all about, not paying people off post-flop. It's the uh, first post-flop skill he talks about in the book. So skill two boils down to this short version. If someone makes a big bet or a raise, fold, especially on later streets. A slightly longer version, if your opponent has played in a way that suggests a strong hand range, fold all your hands that can't compete with that range. So this stuff makes total sense to me. Now, he asks a really good question. What does my opponent rep with this bet on this card? That's what you want to ask at any time. Somebody makes a bet on the turn uh queen of diamonds like I just made. What does that mean? The, my opponent should be asking himself that. Why is he betting this um, at this time? When I bet on the river 10 of diamonds, why is my opponent betting this? How is my eight good against anything that's triple barreling this board? You know, that kind of a thing. So he should be asking himself that question. Um, it's possible you're up against a bluff, but solid rule of thumb, 90% of the time they aren't bluffing. Let me zoom in on this. Might make it easier for you guys watching right now. Actually, let's ditch this. Zoom in even more. Oh, mucho better. Okay, cool beans. Um, where was I at? Okay, the big question right there. So it's possible you're up against a bluff when somebody raises, but a solid rule of thumb that he gives is that 90% of the time they aren't bluffing. More specifically, they don't bluff frequently enough. Most of your opponents don't. And uh, let me show you something. So 90% of the time they aren't bluffing. Yesterday, 
yesterday we went through eight different hands and I wrote my notes here um, in parentheses I put what their bet sizing meant you know he he raised 2x for value 3.5x check raise for value with top pair top kicker so I went through and I just tabulated we went through eight hands in the stream yesterday I also looked at my full ring and I went through two different hands there uh, where I faced where I faced a raise and then I found 2x check raise for value and 4.33x check raise for value so altogether out of these 10 hands only three were bluffs and 70% or 7 of the 10 were value raises value check raises value in position raises however they raised so this is it's a small sample only 10 hands but it's pretty indicative that if people are raising you and raising especially bigger some of these were like 4.33 a lot of 3x raises right here Hmm, there's a 3x bluff 4x in position raise for value on a wet board 3x with top set 3x raise with a nut flush draw um, but a tiny double barrel so that was a semi bluff that was one of them um, 2x check raise with a small pair small over pair which was surely a bluff he wasn't raising for value there no no so I consider that a bluff um, so right here uh, yeah you could see 30% of the time in my small sample Ed Miller says 90% of the time they aren't bluffing so in my estimation it's somewhere in the middle it's probably like I would probably think about for myself the 80 20 rule when you're facing raises and bets like big bets uh, not stack committing but bets that say something that are trying to tell you something 80% um, of the time it's value and 20% it's bluff I'm just cutting between the two he says 90 I say 70 or I say my uh, my previous history says 70 it's in between it's around 80% of the time uh, in small stakes always assume they're bluffing less than 33% of the time at least you've got to assume that not many people bluff more than 33% of the time if they make a pot size bet and you think they can bluff more often then call if less often then fold so 33% he calls it a magical number I don't know if that was the exact term but that's the number that you want to always keep in mind assume they're always bluffing less than that because if somebody makes a pot size bet $100 pot they're betting a hundred you have to call 100 to win a total pot of 300 so um, 33 percent is that magic number right there if they're bluffing less than that fold your hand if you have a bluff catcher if they're bluffing more than that go ahead and call if you think uh, you know they're capable of doing it more than 33 percent here's something he says that's really important when your opponents make big bets on late streets and small stakes games they nearly always have it and are bluffing less frequently than they should this means you should fold every time you cannot beat the hand that they're representing so on that prior hand that we just saw if you think about it what am I repping right here so I'm repping what I showed you I'm repping three of a kind or better for sure most likely it's some kind of a straight or three of a kind the flush is a backdoor flush draw and great I got there in this instance I was aggressive through the streets with it um, but uh, uh, he should have realized that he cannot beat what I'm repping right here he doesn't know anything about me I only have 18 hands on him he's super loose passive he doesn't use a HUD he's not paying attention um, but he should realize that he cannot beat my hand he just beats a stone bluff am I really bluffing three streets with a stone bluff maybe my small sizing on the turn and the small sizing on the river allowed me to get the value maybe if I had bet more he would have folded you know who knows what he's thinking exactly but at this point if you just look at the triple barreling aspect of it on a super scary board and all he has is one two three fourth pair forget it he should have folded and so if he would have read this ahead of time if he learns from Ed Miller he would uh he should have folded that way uh, totally uh, on the river um, so this sentence right here is super applicable on the turn and river a large bet is something that you don't often see at the table maybe once or twice an hour when he talks about uh, you know a big bet a large bet is that stack committing means that they won't fold after making that bet so if somebody bets let's say they have $160 in the pot uh, in like a 1-2 cash game $160 in the pot they have $200 behind and they bet a full hundred dollars they're probably not going to be giving up if you shove on them you know after they bet there's already 260 in the pot you shove on them that puts an additional 200 in the pot is 460 his 100 is going to try to win 460 he's calling so stack committing bets are really important you've got to fold if you can't beat what he's repping with his stack committing bet 
Uh, the earlier in the hand, the more bluffs are possible on the flop. But progressively, less bluffs happen as it gets later in the hand, you know, the turn in the river. And bets on the flop are not reliable indicators of strength. As we know, uh, we talked about in the podcast right now, the C-bet minimum effective dose. People just C-bet willy-nilly all the time. You should be C-betting 70 uh, between 65 and like 75% of the time or so because people see that so much you can't really put a lot of trust that that equals value or a value bet but on the turn in river you can start to put a, a little bit more uh, value impetus behind the bets so the whole book Ed Miller's talking about one two two five and five ten cash games live but everything he talks about can be applied to online so He's talking about one two opponent, which he considers are the lowest. Um, you could think of that like a, a a five cent, ten cent kind of a player, even a ten cent, twenty five cent. The they, the players that play constantly at those stakes, the fish at those stakes, are the lowest um, on the on the totem pole. I guess I don't know. Uh, just the lowest, weakest players. So if a one two opponent makes a large or stack committing bet on the Turner River, assume it's not a bluff. And, you know, you often see this and hear this, and we've all experienced, oh, I've just got a call. I've got to see what he has. I know I'm beat, but I've got a call because I want to know. No, uh, you don't have to do that and make terrible calls when you know you're beat. Just fold it. Um, you can call pre-river, though, with like a set. You can call pre-river like a with a set on a three straight plus three flush board. You've still got outs to beat the made hand and you might even be ahead of two pair or catch a weak flush to beat their straight uh, is one of the examples that he used. So you can call on prior streets when they're still, um, assuming it's not a super big bet or anything, but assuming you still have outs to beat a hand that they're currently repping. Don't be committed to calling rivers when you call the turn. If you called with the above set right here and you put your opponent on a set or better, if you brick, you don't have to call. Only call if you beat the hand they're repping with their bet. This is a very important thing. And that's something my opponent uh, should have taken into account. Summing it up, small stakes players rarely bluff for bet. For big bets. Um, rarely bluff for... Small players, small six players rarely bluff with big bets, and they also rarely bluff pre-flop with three and four bets. That's true as well. Yep, 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 yep. Good, good. And then he talks about multi-way pot and stuff. Um, one of the big takeaways from this is uh, you can easily study this skill and every other skill in the book for a full week. I really recommend that you do that. And that's what I did. I spent the full week studying each skill. So let's say we, we wanted to study this, which we could right now study it for an entire week, skill number two. Um, in the week, you could spend one day each on doing these different filters, placing facing flop turn river raises with showdown to see hand strengths your opponents make these plays with, making flop turn and river raises to see what hands you raise with, um, filtering for heads up pots and multi-way pots separately, filtering for in position, out of position, filtering for different bet sizes, um, like the initial bet size or the raise or the three bet, etc. on the flop, the turn, or the river. Let me show you what that's like real quick, um, because I don't, I don't know that we've ever talked about bet sizing. I don't think so. Actions, opportunities. Let's just talk about the flop right here. So flop bet sizing, nice and simple. Um, the flop bet. So we, you could filter. Let's do this on the flop. Let's say, let's say we made the C bet. Just us, we made the C bet. Let's add to the filter the different sizing options that we can that we can put in. Um, uh, flop bet size, percentage of the pot. Let's say sometimes we bet roughly 50% of the time. Uh, not 50%, 50% pot. So let's go from 0 to 55. If we add that to the filter, we'll see all our flop C bets where we bet somewhere around 55%. Um, ah, we can actually do that a little bit. 45 to 55 in that range which is not often 13 I bet if I go through all of these hands actually we could just take a look here so this is around a 50% we filtered for 50% pot size bets look at that that's a bluff uh, that's basically a bluff I have a weak top pair oh I'm trying to get value out of a guy here with my pocket aces okay let's see here um, oh, where's the pot that's a bluff. I mean, I don't, I have second pair. 
it's not going for value for sure. I'd rather my opponent fold at that point. A bluff. Ooh, I'm betting small with top set, trying to get value out of the guy. And uh, betting, mm, it's kind of a bluff, maybe value, depending on the situation. Ace, deuce, that's a, I just want him to fold at that point. I'm not necessarily going for value with the ace crap kicker. 10-9, top pair, gut shot. That's a semi-bluff. 9-7 is a bluff. King-5 is a bluff. Ace-4 is a bluff. Ace-King is a bluff. So you can see when I use that smaller sizing, it's for a bluff. Now let's look at when I size it up a little bit more. Let's go from 55% to 70%. This is going to include all of those two-thirds pot size bets, uh, which are value and bluffs right here. A lot more hands. So you can see I don't often bet that 50%. Those are just certain situations. And then look at all of these different hands that I'm betting it with. Uh, over pair, two pair, over pair, over pair, top pair, decent kicker, 9-8. Oh, just a straight bluff, over pair, ace king, top pair, top kicker. Let's look at some of this MP stuff. Uh, top set, over pair, flush, uh, top pair, backdoor flush, backdoor straight draw, set, top pair, uh, no, over pair, uh, and under pair right there. So it's just, if he doesn't have a king, he might be giving me value with nines, tens, eights, sevens, and sixes, um, or I'm just getting a non-king to fold right there. Um, over pair, over pair, oh, second pair, that's kind of a bluff. Uh, second pair, kind of a bluff. Top pair, top kicker, top pair, top kicker. So you could see when I up my bet sizing when it's bigger, in general, I'm going for value here. Uh, let's see. Now let's look at it even bigger between 70 and we'll say 80. 70 and 80 for the three quarter pop bet. So we could see I'm pretty decent size winner right here. And a lot of these hands out of the six, I won five. That means I'm going for value mostly, going for a lot of value there. Ace 10, let's take a look at these. Top pair, top pair, uh, just a semi bluff, semi bluff. Yeah, so some of these bets too are semi bluffs and bluffs. But you can see just in general, I think I'm going for value more when I size it bigger. Kings, ace, king, king, nine. Let's see what these hands were. Oh, gutter over pair uh just making a bluff king deuce a bluff pocket kings value yep so in general as my bet sizing increases my hands get stronger so that's something to know about me when you're playing against me you should fold every single time i bet two-thirds pot i'm just kidding uh what do we got here oh so the last thing we wanted to do for today was Okay, so we want to filter for facing turn and river raises with showdown. Ed Miller says at low stakes, these are rarely bluffs. Um, and then so this is going to be a little tick sheet that we'll kind of go along. But we're going to be filtering for turn and river raises with showdown here. Oh, facing turn and river raises. So we'll start off. Uh, yeah, we'll start off with the turn. So turn bets, we made a turn bet. You know, we need to make a bet to face a raise for sure. So turn bet. Turn opportunities now. We have the opportunity to three bet. So you just count one, two, three, or just like pre-flop. You know, the big blind is the first bet. So the first raise is a two bet, and then there's a three bet. Same thing post-flop. The first bet you put out is a one bet. The first raise is a two bet. The second raise is a three bet. So with this, we put out a bet and then somebody raised us. So we have the opportunity to three bet. We didn't see, we're not seeing if we did or not. Um, we're seeing all the chances just to make a three bet. And then let's also add filter because we want to see what hands our opponents are doing this with. Let's see some showdown stuff. Oh, oh only four hands. It's not much at all. So, um, well, we'll start with the BB, these ones right here. Uh, so what was my tick sheet here? Facing raises tick sheet. What are we facing here? So we just called a set mine, flop our set, check, check. We decide to bet for value. He raises us and then we re-raise and he calls cool beans we should be able to get it in here well i hope so so we 
check in order to get him because um, we just uh, I shouldn't have checked right here. I should have gone for gone for max value against the guy, you know. Um, so I would say we had a set, but he could have been raising us at this point. And we're not going to ever know his cards because this is ACR. This is a bummer. But most likely he raised us. How much did he raise us? 280, a full 4x. He's raising what he's thinking is for value. He's raising with a queen nine uh, or just a queen, king queen, ace queen, possibly. He's raising us for value right there because he called. If he was raising as a bluff, if he had just a couple of clubs, we made a pretty good size race. He would be folding quite often, um, I believe, although he doesn't fold much. I'm going to say he, from his perspective, even though we don't see his cards, he made a value raise. I'm going to say. I could be wrong, but that's what we'll go with here. Next hand, a seven. Okay, we're set mining or flush mining. Ooh, flush draw, nice, check, check. And then we bet because we hit our hand, he raises. Uh, it's not a bad raise. I mean, the pot's so small. It's a 2.6x raise, so whatever. And then we re-raise small to get value out of the guy. And then he calls. So I'm thinking... I hope we get to we won't get to see show now and we bet big and he called so he made a value raise with queen 10 oh it was a value raise because he had flopped his straight and just slow played it right there oh and he had hardly any stacked behind too so i'm gonna once again check value right there uh king deuce so a two check so we picked up some equity with the flush draw we still have our pair we could hit two pair on a river king trips on a river deuce um, river diamond gives us a flush so you know we like our chances so we've got to throw out the bet right here just to try to blow him off the hand he raises us and then we call so he raised that turn and now he just checks the river so it's probably probably a jack right maybe even he wouldn't be scared of a seven it's probably just a weak jack queen jack ace jack queen six so that was a bluff raise interesting nice definitely i mean yeah sir he had a pair but that definitely was not a raise um against us he wasn't going for value with that with that pair of uh wait a second let me double check that yeah just a diamond draw weak pair wasn't a value raise aces now so we lead after making the pre-flop three bet okay of course we do that he calls three bucks bet again so he called us on the one street and we bet smaller to get value because we've got the nuts um yeah sure he could have deuce five suited but what are the chances limping and then calling a three bet deuce five or min raising and then calling. No, he's not doing that. Um, great, we get raised. So six, there's now $16 in the pot. If we call, I think a min re-raise right back is what I should do. I didn't min re-raise it, but I raised it a good amount. Oh, lovely, good. So he raised us on that ace. Let's see what he ends up having in the end. And we check just to let him get him to, to bet. What is happening? Oh, the flush draw gets there. Yeah, okay, I understand. Don't need to commit the rest of the stack when a hand that he is repping the whole time. He is possibly repping a flush draw. Look how passive the guy is. He likes to call and see flops. So given that he probably likes to call flops to see turns with a draw likes to call turns to see rivers with a draw so at this point we're just checking and then calling any bet like if he would have shoved i'm sure i would have called right here too yep uh king 10 that was just a bluff bet interesting ah so we're 50 50 now for the raises let's see so that's on the uh turn that was on the turn. Let's take a look now. Hands that went to showdown.
same filter, just uh, set for the river now. Ah, only two instances. Let's take a look at these. Oh, just a limp and then we limp behind. Okay, cool. Hit our two pair, going for value. The four comes. And a call, okay. And the queen nine two pair. And then we, oh, it's just a min raise. We've got to call here. Yeah, sure. He could have a he could have a, a four, but he could also have a nine seven for a flop two pair that he slow played on two streets. Um, uh, he could have a random queen, king queen, which we beat queens and fours two pair with our queen nine. Got a call here, and he could he could have uh, had a four, of course, king jack. So that one on the river was a bluff. Whoops, interesting. We're seeing lots of bluffs here. Still got our draw. I'm probably going to be calling here with two overs. So I've got the nine outs plus another six outs for an over pair. Uh, 15 outs total. I'm probably calling this. Call. Hit to flush. We bet. Ooh, that's a huge raise. It's a 5x raise. Is he doing this with just a random three for a straight? I doubt that. Is he doing it with two pair? No. Is he doing it with a weaker flush? Like a 10 high, 10 8 flush. How are his 10 eights? He's betting with a 10 high flush or eight high flush, let's just say. Yeah, okay, okay, or flush draw. Uh, another small bet, okay, with a flush draw, yep. Uh, and I could see him making them with, with smaller flush draws as well. And now that hits. Is he really going to though, we suddenly wake up with aggression. We could have had, you know, a king high flush draw, a queen high flush draw the whole time. Is he making this raise with an eight high flush draw, a seven high, a 10 high flush draw? I doubt it. I think I should have folded here. Yeah, because it's a good size raise, like Ed Miller said. If he's repping um, with such a large bet size, maybe it's not stack committing. Maybe if I shoved, he's folding all but the king or the queen high flush. Um, but I think it's pretty close to being pot committing here. Um, yeah, I think it is. So that size bet just means that he has a better flush than me. I should have folded. King, queen. Oh, he had a lock on that hand um yeah so that's definitely a value raise right there so well so far we've seen 50 50 it is a small sample that we're looking at only 9,000 hands and you don't often encounter uh the raises on the turns and rivers um with showdown i should say so let's go to this right here uh more filters let's go back to that first filter bet opportunity to three bet let's see what that filter looks like in general okay only 11 hands to go through that's great that's quick and easy here um some of these have the some of these are those uh, original four hands that had showdown um so let's just take a look on the button real quick Now we face a raise, we have the flush draw plus the over pair. We're definitely calling, holy cow. What just happened? Now that is a terrible play. I have a flush draw. It's a tiny min raise. I wish I could watch the game tape. I doubt I timed out. I probably folded for some really odd reason. The guy is aggressive. His betting in general, sure, he's out of position, but on the turn, he bets 47% of the time, in position 80% of the time. How often does he check raise? Oh, wrong one. He check raises here 14% on the flop, 0% on the turn. Sure, I mean, he's probably got a value hand. Most likely he has a value hand. He's t more turn honest than he is flop honest. Um, but it's just a min raise right here, and we have so many redraws to a great hand. Uh, and he could be doing this seriously with like a nut flush draw, um, which we currently beat because we have the top pair. So, because uh, he can't have a nut flush draw with a 10, he can't have ace 10 of spades. 
So he could be doing this with a ton of different draws as well as sets and two pairs, um, but we beat that kind of stuff. So, oh man, I don't like that fold at all. So from that hand, we have no idea if he's bluffing or not. He could be bluffing, could be going for value. Let's see here. Okay, I'm good with that. Oh, I picked up a little gutter. Continue, continuation bet right there. And now we get raised, exactly a min raise, different player, Mad Max. And then we fold right there. Yep, yep, it looks like, I mean, we don't, yeah, we really don't know. Check raise, 19%. He likes to check raise on the flop is a bluff. Um, check raise on the river as well, but none on the turn yet. Yeah, this might be another instance. You know, it's not a great hand. This hand has so little equity. Um, basically, I just want to see a 7 or an 8 or a 5. Um, I should have probably just checked behind to see a free river right here and not been blown off the hand. So that's another. That could have been a bluff. So maybe at these low stakes against these aggressive players, maybe they are bluffers when it comes to raises. Um, yeah, replay all hands in report. Let's take a look at these last two hands. Okay, ace three suit, I'm good. Got a couple of players. Uh, well, I should have definitely thrown out the c-bet here. I raised from under the gun. It looks strong. He folds 100. He only folds 18, but he's super loose passive. Um, he could be calling with any two crappy cards. I think I should throw out the c-bet here, uh, the bluff c-bet, because I don't want to get called with my bottom pair. Should have c-bet. A delayed c-bet, but look at that. It's even less than half pod. It's an ugly one. And I get raised 3x, and so I just fold. I know it. Yep, yep. I think I should have let out at that flop. I would have had a better idea of what my uh, opponents had and didn't let them catch a free over pair there. Three bets a lot. Oh. You know, I'm not, it's not the worst of calls. Um, but in this instance, I kind of prefer a 3-bet with 8-9 suited. Um, because with 8-9, right now, I, c I cannot... Whoops, wrong one. Oh, yeah, no, that is what I wanted. Uh, early, oh, only 6%. Maybe that's why I didn't 3-bet right there. Um, he only raises 6% in EP. EP is where he really... Uh, it, he does not treat it as a steal position. He's tight in EP. So, yeah, I don't like a 3-bet. Actually, I, I'm, I'm good with a fold or a call. And so I decided to call opening up uh, for these guys to be doing a little three-bet squeeze action. But, you know, thankfully nobody did. We got to see a flop. Probably lost a little more money because of that, but, oh, we'll see. So I bet a buck. Good. Open ender. Backdoor flush draw. Now the flush hits, and then we bet, and then he raises 3x right there. And then we fold, of course, because we just didn't have anything on that board. Just trying to rep, uh, just I guess trying to rep a flush or top two pair, top pair, or something like that. And he caught us right there. Yep, yep, yep. So when it comes to seeing no showdowns, you don't really get an idea of, you don't know for sure whether or not they did it as a bluff or, or not. Um, actually, we might see on this hand. Oh, wait, this is that hand we already took a look at. Yeah, so he raised right there as a bluff. That was one that we know for sure was a bluff. This was one of those showdown hands. Yeah, so um, that's one of the things, like, what you want to do is look at just a bigger sample of hands, as big as you can. We're only looking through 98, 9,700 hands. Um, so as, as your database grows, you can just get a better idea of what your opponents are playing with and on a lot of different sites other than acr like this is all these winning winning network hands um when i win the pot i don't get to see my opponents holding so if they were bluffing when they raised the turn or the river i'm most of the time not going to know i'm only going to know if they had uh, a strong hand right there so this database is a little mm, a little tough to get an idea of what my opponents are raising with. Um, the only time I know for sure is if they raise, I re-raise, and they fold their hand. It means they were bluffing, or they just realized their, their weak top pair, second pair, was beat kind of thing. Yep, yep. So that's it for this study session. So that Ed Miller's book is a really... Um, oh, we didn't do this in the making raises, but we're already at an hour now. Um, and then win rates, this kind of stuff. Yeah, this is stuff I'll go through later on uh, when I do some additional studies later on.
But thank you very much, everybody, for joining today. I'll be back in about four hours from now with study session number two, where we're going to be learning from uh, this video right here and then um, going through our database for flopping top pair and facing raises. All righty. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate your time today. appreciate your eyeballs. Um, and thank you very much. And I'll see you in four hours.